If you'll stand with me for the reading of God's word. I'll be reading from Romans 6, 15 to 23. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed and having been set free from sin have, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once were presented your for just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your memory, uh, your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Amen. Hey, will you throw that last slide back up one more time, please? I know that most of you guys may have heard of verse 23 before. Maybe you've even memorized it in times past, but I would just like to ask you if you would repeat it with me. All right, ready? For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. If you're new with us, we're in a series in the book of Romans. And so we've just been preaching uh, through that book. We're now in chapter six, where my wife Anna uh, read from this morning. And as we begin, I wanna give us a quick review of kind of where we've been. So last week in last week's sermon, Pastor Eric preached on the first section of Romans six. And Paul was asking an interesting question in 6.1, if you wanna follow us along in the text. Basically, the question was, should we go on sinning that grace would a what? Abound. What does that mean? It means just because we know that the believer will get more and more grace and forgiveness and undeserved love from God, should we keep on sinning? What's the answer? You tell me. No. Paul's response is absolutely not. Eric Sunt version is don't even think about it. That's what he said last week. Uh, just like a person who is allergic to certain foods shouldn't eat them because they know that the EpiPen is always available, so too, just because the believer knows that they will experience grace from God, they shouldn't keep on sinning. And Paul asked a similar question in chapter 6, verse 15, our text this morning. He's getting at the same point, but he's going at it from a different angle. Paul goes from asking if the believer should keep on sinning because God will give more and more grace to asking this question. Should the believer keep on sinning because they are now living in a new realm, okay? You're in a new realm this morning if you're a believer. You're under a new reality this morning. Paul says in uh, Romans 6, 15, that you're under grace. Now, everybody take a breath in. You guys... Smell that grace this morning? Yes, I do. So Paul is pointing out this. A transformation has happened for the believer the day you believed the gospel and were saved, okay? The day you believed that Christ died for your sins and raised again, defeating hell and death in the grave, you went from being under the Mosaic law to being under grace. So Being under the Mosaic law or just think like the Ten Commandments or something like that is like having someone back a dump truck up next to you and then dumping a load of heavy rock on you. You, Is that pleasant? (laughs) No, it's not, right? Why? Because the law 
has no power to rescue us. It just actually reveals our need and therefore our guilt. So merely knowing that, that these things like God's word and the law doesn't make you any more good with God. It actually makes you more condemned before God. You feel the weight of that? You feel the weight of being under the law? But those who believe on the gospel and the good news of what Christ has done go from being under the condemning effects and the curse of breaking the law, breaking God's word, to being under the rescuing and restoring effects of grace. Is that good news this morning? It is. So being under grace is the opposite of being crushed under a load of heavy rock, okay? It's more like being under the refreshing and life-giving cascade of a mini waterfall. Can you, can you picture that? After a long, hard day of work and being grody and you're about to have a heat stroke, and then that refreshing cascade of the mini waterfall comes down upon you. And Paul's point is that being under grace doesn't just result and having forgiveness of your sins before God, it doesn't only result in being justified before God, declared righteous, but it also results in this, being connected to the very life of Christ. Sanctification, the possible of being conformed into the image of God. So faith in the gospel is like getting your dead and broken down car battery linked up to Jesus's life-giving car battery and him giving you an eternal jump, okay? You know what I'm saying? That's what we're talking about. His sin-conquering and triumphing power coursing through your veins now, okay? Right now, wherever you are in this seat, if you are alive together with Christ. That's why Paul asked, before he asked his hearers to do anything, this is so cool, Read the book of Romans. Read how we're dead in our sins and trespasses. We're born that way. Build up to the hope of the gospel. And before Paul asks his hearers to do anything, he first announces what Christ has done for them, right? And before he asks them to do anything, he wants to tell us what he's done to them when he united them to his victorious life the day they believed. That's the power of grace. You're not just a sinner saved by grace, right? That's true. You've been forgiven. You've been loved more than you ever deserved, but you're also been given grace and given new life in Christ Jesus. You're alive in his power. You're alive in his victory if you're a Christian this morning. So quick review of the verses that we looked at that told us that in in Romans 6 before this text this morning, morning. Romans 6, 4, it says, We were buried, therefore, with Jesus by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too may walk in newness of life. That's you this morning. Romans 6, 10, for the death Jesus died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Romans 6, 13, if you're following along. You are those who have been, listen, listen, brought from death to life. That has already happened. Sin has no dominion over you. That is a promise. It's not a possibility. It is a promise. Verse 14, you are under grace. Here's my main point for this section. Paul knows that the only hope of living for God, the only hope for living for God, is by living out of the freedom produced by life-imparting grace. That's the only hope. If you want to live for God this morning, the only way you can do that is by living out of the freedom produced by life-imparting grace. And that's the title of my sermon this morning. See, in this section that we're going to be looking at uh, in verses 16 through 23, Paul is basically setting up a before and after picture. You guys like before and after pictures? I love them. I love before and after pictures, you know, like the picture of the person before they go on the diet, like you've seen that. Why are they always frowning in that picture before they go? I don't know. I mean, are they trying to sell something? I don't know, right? But that picture, you've seen it a thousand times. They're frumpy and flabby. And then the after shot, now they're happy and hunky and handsome, you know, you know how that goes. We're seeing a a before and after shot of spiritually. That's what Paul's pointing out in this huge text in verse 16 through 23. But Paul's before and after is 
What was life like pre-Christian, pre-conversion, pre-salvation? He's going to use a lot of past tense verbs. He's going to say were, and it once was like this. And then he's going to highlight, but now something else has happened. You've become something else in Jesus. Your identity has shifted. You're something new. You're not just David. Now Christ is living in you, right? That's what he's pointing out. And this is what he's saying. Even now, that's the hope of the believer. You know, you wake up sometimes and you feel discouraged. You mess up in life. Like I had an accident this week that was actually my fault, you know, uh, driving a car accident. And you think a lot of things about you that sometimes are true. Sometimes those things have been forced upon you. And sometimes we live out of lies, right? We live out of things that are not ultimately true about us, and it shapes the way we believe and think and feel and the things that we do in practice. And Paul is saying from this text, live out of your new identity in Jesus. It is life-changing. I have three points, no poems this morning. I'll work on that for next Sunday. Okay, first point, life imparting grace produces a new identity and master, Romans 6, 16. Paul starts with a very provocative concept, in my opinion. He's pointing out this. All people, Christians and non-Christians alike, are slaves to something. You say, wait, what? No, 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 not me. I do what I want. I'm not a slave to anyone. Paul is actually showing this point. Either, look at the, the wording in the text, verse 16, either you're a slave to sin when you walked in here this morning, that is a slave to sin, self. You're serving and obeying your own idols, idols of your making, idols of this culture, idols of your heart. You say like, what are we talking about? I'm talking about serving money, serving lust, serving pleasure, power, your own self-identity. And he's saying that the result of that is destruction and death in the now. That's the result of that. Or, so you're either doing that or you're doing this. You're a slave to obeying God. He only gives two options here. You're either a slave to sin or you're a slave to obeying God, which results in Jesus' empowering righteousness through you, through your heart, through your life in the now, right? As one pastor put it, the question is not with Paul whether someone will have a master. The question for Paul is which master will we serve today? Isn't that a good question this morning? Which master will you serve today? Paul, what he's doing right here is crazy. He's been talking about freedom, 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 freedom in all the verses up to verse 15. And we're like, what does that look like? I love this freedom. I'm excited about this freedom. And then he's gonna unpack what it means. And he's flipping our culture's understanding of what freedom is on their head. Freedom for Paul is not found in being able to do whatever you want with your body. It's not found in being able to make the rules about your gender or calling the shots about your life. It's not found in being in charge. Paul says something radical. He says, freedom for the Christian is paradoxically, paradoxically only found when you invite God in as your master. When you say, I'm done with living for me. When you say, I transfer ultimate allegiance and total control of my life to the living Lord, Jesus Christ. And Paul's saying, that's the only time. That's finally when a person actually begins to experience true freedom. That's what Paul's teaching. And Paul is saying, freedom is found in submitting to the one who made you who redeems you and who wants to remake you into everything he wants you to be in Christ. That's what freedom is. When he does that for his glory and his ultimate good, I mean, in your ultimate good. And a lot of times we buck against that. We buck against God being in control, but God's like, you're fighting against true freedom. You're, try, you're fighting against truly living in abundance. You're fighting against true life. When you do that, Paul is saying in this text, it's obvious whose you are by how you obey. You're either God's slave or your sin's slave. You're either bound to sin or you are free in Christ. I remember, I remember the day that I got saved. I was 17 years old. And in that moment, 
I heard the gospel again for the umpteenth time. And on that day, uniquely, God worked in my heart, revealed my sin, revealed the beauty of his gospel, his undeserved love for me, his promised life, if I would only believe. And I said, Jesus, I am no longer in control of David Lyles. I relinquish my life to you. And I found everlasting life in him. And if you're a believer, you did the same. And if you're not a believer and you're not a Christian today, I'm telling you, find true freedom in being slaves to God today. Second point, life imparting grace produces new attitudes and practices. Romans 6, 17 through 21. Remember, don't forget, grace links you to the crucified and resurrected Christ. Paul says, verse 17, thanks be to God that you who were once slave to sin became obedient from the, look at that text. What does it say? Obedient from the, you tell me, heart. Became obedient from the heart. That is, became obedient from the what? Inside, right? To the standard of teaching to which you were committed and having been set free from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. Now, let's think on that concept, obedience from the heart, okay? As contrasted with merely exterior obedience to God, right? Merely checking the box, right? Mere performance with God. That's the contrast, right? You see that? There's an old movie called The Princess Bride. Anybody ever seen that movie, The Princess Bride? Okay, in that movie, Wesley is a young peasant farmer who works and serves Princess, you tell me, Princess Buttercup, okay? And when she asked him to do something, Wesley would always respond, as you wish. Some people have seen the movie, okay? And then gladly and quickly, that's the point here in the illustration, gladly and quickly do whatever Princess Buttercup said. And the farm boy Wesley, or later disguised as the dread pirate Roberts, right, even at one time comically agreed to die after she pushed him down a huge hill. And as he was rolling down the hill, he yelled, as you wish, even unto death, right? That's what he did. That's what the movie's like. And on this note, the grandpa, grandpa narrator in the movie said this, Princess Buttercup was amazed to discover that when Wesley was saying, as you wish, what he actually meant and was saying was, I love you, okay? That's what he said. And here's the thing Paul is telling us. At conversion, we went from slaves to sin to becoming obedient to the heart to God, to his gospel to the word of God. See, before salvation, we may have had religion. This is really important. I want you to listen, especially in the Bible, but I want you to listen to this. Before salvation, you may have had religion. You may have intellectual agreement. Like, oh, I agree with those facts. I agree with that doctrine. I agree intellectual with that thought, that concept. I agree intellectually with that Bible verse. Or you may even had before Christ exterior behavior modification. Talking the talk, walking the walk. But what Paul's saying is you could have had all those things and not had Christ. You could have had all those things, but not true transformation that comes from being linked to Christ by faith and his life working through you. This is the glory of the Christian life. As one pastor said, the gospel actually enables people to follow Jesus, not out of slavish fear and anxiety, but instead out of childlike love and gratitude. Isn't that good? That's why Paul says in verse 17, thanks be to God. When I think about how he saved me, I want to live for him out of gratitude, not because I want anything from him, right? Believers can now obey God, not because they have to, but because they want to. Believers can now obey God, not in order to get something from God, but because they've already received everything they truly needed in salvation from God in Christ Jesus. The point here is Jesus's spirit gives people a renewed heart and mind, an inward life at salvation that makes a Chick-fil-A response possible. You guys know what I'm talking about? Anybody been to the Christian chicken lately? What do they say after they 
serve your order, take your tray, give you a breath mint. We all need it, you know, sometimes. What do they say? My pleasure. pleasure. And Paul is saying this, it's my pleasure style of obedience toward God is now actually a possibility. Isn't that beautiful? You're like, think of all the religion in life and all the doing because you have to. And then think about what Christ produces in a person that's so unique that's so attractive, that you are drawn to because it's so different than what the world and the flesh has to offer. I'm talking about newness of life in Christ. And back to what I was earlier talking about, my conversion at the age 17. Before Christ, I'll tell you what I had. I had a great Christian upbringing by my my parents. That's what I had. I went to church probably every time the doors were open. And back, back then, you went on Sunday night. That was, that's a joke, okay? That's a joke. So if you're going on Sunday night, that's great. But you went every time the doors were open back then. I knew stuff. I knew scripture. I had it memorized. I knew all the stuff. So I had re- religious conformity to rules. I had a knowledge of the Bible. I'd heard the gospel countless times, but I had never been born again. And that's what God's saying. You need new life in Christ, you need him to change your heart and your mind. That's only going to happen when you're linked up to Christ by faith and he saves you. Think about it for a moment. Kids and adults alike, you can actually have joy in serving other people. Isn't that a beautiful thing? You can enjoy that. You can like make a meal for your guest after service and you can enjoy that and worship the Lord in that. Kids, You can enjoy giving your parents some of your Easter candy later on tonight. You know what I'm saying? That's a possibility. All the parents said, amen, Amen, right? I'm just joking, but I'm kind of serious, kids. All right, so, but this is the beauty. You can have joy in sacrifice. Again, that makes Christianity so amazing, like people laying their lives to, to take care of sick people, right? In tragic moments, like back in the day when disease and all that stuff was breaking loose in a town and people weren't like, oh, it's COVID, I'm gonna just protect myself. They were giving their lives for other people. They were coming out of their own houses and into the masses to serve and love and and share God's truth. This is the beauty of Christianity. But Paul's pointing out that being united to Christ doesn't just transform a person's attitude towards obedience to God it actually also changes someone's attitude towards sin. Fast forward to verse 21 if you're following along with me in Romans 6. But the fruit, what fruit were you from the, uh, gaining from the things of which you are now, what does the text say? Now what? Ashamed. Ashamed. There's been a transformation in your attitude towards sin because you believed on the gospel and were saved. And what Paul is saying, to use the language of Philippians 3.19, before salvation, you know what we used to do? We used to glory in our shame. That's what I did. I would like try to, to get with other girls who clearly at that time were not my wife. And I boasted about it with the other guys in the locker room and on sports teams. That's called glorying in your shame, okay? That's just one of the many things I did. But Paul says that when you were saved, Christ changed your attitude towards sin. We used to do the things that were unrighteous and ungodly and celebrate them. And when Christ came and changed our hearts, it changed our view on sin. Isn't that a beautiful thing? To be able to look at our sin, even in our past and say this, that is actually wrong. Can you say that today? Can you say certain things are actually wrong? Yes, if the Bible says it is, right? to say it's wrong. I'm ashamed of what I did in my past. I don't wanna ever do it again, but here's the catch for the believer. But in Christ, I am completely forgiven. I am completely loved. See, healthy biblical shame is always a shame that leads us to despising our sin and trusting in our sinless savior who actually bore our shame. I'm saying he bore everything that you've ever done. If you're in Christ, if you're a believer, he bore the shame that you deserved and he took it away because he paid for it in his own death and resurrection. And being united to Christ doesn't only change our attitudes, it changed our practices. Look at verse 19. 
Paul explains that even though the slave of God is an imperfect analogy, he's still going to use it because it's imperfectly communicating his point. A new master means a new pattern of living. It means new practices. It means new habits. Did you guys realize that? So we've all got specific patterns of living and habits. My wife, for example, when she wakes up in the morning, she stays in bed and prays a little bit, gets on her phone, reads the Bible, checks her emails and probably her calendar, responds to some text. I think that's kind of what's going on over there. <laughs> then she gets up and uses the bathroom. It's like clockwork, guys. It's like, tick, tick, tick. I know. I'm like, it's going to be next and that and that. She brushes her teeth. And then sometimes she tries to make up the bed, even with me still in it. Okay, that's how it goes. We've got to get it done, okay? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Kids, you might have your own routine. You get up, you get ready for school. Maybe you have normal eating times. Maybe you practice sports after school. I don't know. Sometimes we have bad habits, like every time we have a free moment, we check the phone. Has anything happened on the phone, right? Or maybe you have bad habits and every time you have a free moment, you're biting your fingernails. I don't know, okay? But Paul is saying this, something drastically changed in our patterns and practices the day we were united to Christ. Christ has done that. We once, to use the verse here, presented our members, not just, Paul says members, it's not just your arms and your legs, but all of yourself, both inwardly and outwardly. You used to present those members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness. Lawlessness. That means we woke up in the morning and you say, I never did this. I don't remember myself doing this. It's like it's happening regardless of if you know it. You wake up in the morning and you say, sin and self reporting for duty. That's what you say if you're not in Christ. Reporting for duty. Let's do what feels good or feels right or makes us most happy or let's do what we feel like we can't help but do. And Paul says, it's a snowball effect if you live that way. The more we rolled along in that old pattern, the more we were enslaved to those patterns and the more those sinful practices multiplied and grew in our lives. And then Paul says, but for the believer, they've been changed. Jesus freed us through the gospel and enslaved us to himself so that now, verse 19, we actually have the power to say no. We can wake up and say, no sin. No impurity, no God dishonoring lawless deeds. Yes to the resurrected King Jesus. Isn't that good? You now have the power to present your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength to righteousness. And Paul's point is the more you do that, the more it causes you to want to do it some more. And the more you begin to look like Jesus, that's the basic meaning of sanctification growing in Christ likeness in your heart and in your actions, waking up on the, in the morning and signing on the dotted line and saying, hey, today I wanna look like Christ, even if it hurts. That'd be hard to say, right? I told you I got into an accident in the, in the car a couple of days ago. It was my fault. Um, and in that moment, sorry, I forgot what I was gonna say, but let me look at my past notes on a second. Oh, even if it hurts. That morning, I was praying in my devotional time with the Lord, the morning of the accident, and the Lord just brought in a text that I had been thinking on in the past. Uh, probably ha had tried to memorize it like 10 years prior. And the Holy Spirit just boop, brought it into my mind that morning. And I prayed this, Lord, all I want to do is know you. I want to know you. That's what I want to do. I want to know you. And I said these very dangerous words. I want to know you in the power of your suffering. And I want to know you in the power of your resurrection. And that, two hours from then or whatever, I got in that accident. And you're saying like, what are you saying? And I'm saying, look, when we pray and ask God to conform us into his image, it doesn't mean just he's going to do it all the easy ways, <laughs> right? He's going to conform you in, into his image when you and your wife just get along all the time. no. <laughs> He's gonna conform you in his image and by your suffering and trials and difficulties in life. And Paul is saying, that's what I'm calling you to today, church. That is what we're calling you to. So what does that look like practically? Well, some, someone said something you don't like on the way to church this morning. Uh, it's hypothetical, okay? 
Somebody says something that was offensive when you were getting ready or at, even at church, maybe somebody says something that was mean to you. And what it looks like practically in that moment is you have to decide this. Is Jesus my master or is my desire to look good and feel good in that moment? To be a, is, is my master my desire to feel appreciated and to feel loved significantly? You can in that moment choose to live out of your old identity. What's that old identity? Slave to sin. But is that you, Christian? No, it's not. You can choose to live out of that old identity, use the words of your mouth to make you look better. Hey, I'm not really like that. Or you can use the words of your mouth to make you make the other person look worse, right? Say something to put that person down or to tear them apart. Or in that moment, you can remember you're a slave to God, right? You can remember that God knows the truth. He loves me even at my worst and maybe my spouse or that person doesn't even know how bad I really am, right? And I can repent in that moment of anything that I actually might be guilty of and ask God to make pleasing Jesus the ruling motivation of my life. And then amazing, here's the power of the resurrection. You can in a loving, kind, non-sarcastic way say something nice, respond with love, respond with service, respond with grace. This is where the rubber meets the road, right? This is the power of the resurrection in actual real time in life. Final point, life imparting grace produces new fruit now and a new future outcome. Romans 6, 21 through 23. So in verse 20, Paul says, before you weren't a Christian, you were free in regards to righteousness He's not saying you weren't responsible for righteousness. He's saying you were incapable of true righteousness. Your so-called freedom was that you could not do what pleased God because you weren't in Christ and Christ was not in you. And the result pre-Christian, pre-salvation was this. You were a failed farmer. Got it? And what you boasted of was truckloads of rotten fruit. You're like, hey, check out all this rotten fruit. Isn't it amazing? That's what you were doing. Pre-salvation. You ever gotten some bad fruit, by the way? I mean, the other day I got some fruit and like day one, the strawberry had a fuzzy white jacket, okay? It's supposed to be gross when you read it. You're like, this is not a good thing. And Paul's saying in verse 21, but what fruit were you getting at the time when you were lost? What was being produced in your life? To use Galatians 5, we know what kind of things were produced pre-Christian. Sexual immorality, Paul says in Galatians 5. I'll put it on the back wall. Impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. And Paul says in verse 21, These fruits filled the unbeliever's heart and life. And afterwards, you know what happens afterwards? They die. You can put that down. It means you die eternally. Sin is the unbeliever's fruit now. And the full harvest that's coming for the unbeliever is the harvest of hell and separation from God. And that should not be celebrated. It's really sad, right? It should not be envied. It's illogical. Why give yourself to sin in this life for such a short time, maybe 30 years, maybe 60 years, maybe 80 years, only to die and experience eternal separation from God forever? And then Paul does this, I love this. He says, but that's not what's true for you, believer. You've been united to the crucified and risen Christ. Jesus Christ reigns and he reigns over you and he reigns in you. Look at verse 22. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. The fruit that you get leads to what? You tell me, sanctification. And its end is what? You tell me, eternal life. What? That's pretty cool, isn't it? That's pretty amazing. When you got saved, you were united to Jesus the vine and you were previously dead and disconnected, that rotten branch producing rotten fruit And now in Christ, Jesus pours his life-giving sap out through you and outpours his heart 
in his character. It's called sanctification. The faithful farmer is cultivating and producing his fruit in you. And this is what it looks like, Galatians 5.20. But the Holy Spirit, you can put that slide up there, produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Here's the thing. That fruit is imperfect, but for the believer, it's actually there, right? At various times, you seem to be growing more in some areas, areas, but less in others, Christian, but you're still growing, right? And for the believer, Paul's point is at the end of this brief life where Jesus produced some really good, yet sometimes small, sometimes large fruit, but it was always imperfect fruit. At the end of that life for the believer, you know what harvest they get? Eternal life, everlasting life. And as you look at that, the question begins to, to be, well, how is that even possible? I mean, throughout the process of my life as a believer in the sanctification process, I never stop sinning. I deserve physical death. I deserve eternal death as my pay, as my wage for doing the work of sin. How is it possible to gain everlasting joy and everlasting life in the presence of the risen Christ? And here's what Paul wants to say in verse 23. It's a free gift of God's grace. It's a free gift. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. Verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. As we conclude, think about this. We did all the sinning and Jesus did all the saving. That's the beauty of the gospel. I gave God sin. That's what I gave him. And what he did was he gave me the gift of salvation in Christ. I deserve death physically and eternally. And what God the Father does is he gave me life by linking me to the Messiah King, the Savior, and the Son of God, Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's why Paul says over and over, over all of it, over salvation, that is justification, where he declares you right before God on the basis of faith, and what he says over the sanctification that he's working in us day by day, ups and downs, trials and tribulations, producing Jesus's life through us in real time, in real decisions, he says over all of it, he says, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. A couple of application, and then we'll conclude with some singing. Do you believe that Christ died for your sins and raised again to give you new life? Have you ever submitted to Jesus in faith as your savior, your God, your master, and received the free gift of salvation today? If that's you and you've not done that, I'm begging you to do that today. You say, I've got knowledge about the Bible. I, I actually really don't care. I don't mean that disrespectfully. You say, hey, I've checked a lot of boxes. I'm doing a lot of religious things. I actually don't really care in that regard. I'm asking you, has you have you submitted in faith to King Jesus and received his undeserved salvation? And if that's you this morning, you've not done that, I'm asking you to do that today. Second, more for Christians. Christ has changed you through his, the new birth and through salvation. And my question is, will you thank him? Will you thank him in this moment as we pause for prayer or as we sing and we begin to worship or a few minutes from now or an hour from now at your uh, resurrection or Easter gatherings that you're gonna do? And will you thank him? Will you pause and thank him for the work he's done to forgive you? But would you pause in this moment and thank him for what he's doing in your life as he produces his life in you and through you? I mean, think about that for a minute. Many of us in the room can say, hey man, I've been struggling with X, Y, Z, but I've seen some growth and progress through grace and Jesus is at work in my life. Or maybe you can turn around and tell your spouse or your friend who's a Christian, say, I see what Christ is doing in you. I wanna give him the glory. I wanna give him the praise. I wanna give him all the thanks. Another question, is there something God has pinpointed in your life today and is saying this question, how do you need to live out of your true identity today in that regard? Maybe there's something you need to surrender, someone you need to rescind, surrender, some mindset, 
some amount of money. Maybe you need to turn over your phone or your Instagram account or your streaming sessions, the things you watch on TV to God in some way. Maybe you need to give up your hands and your feet in a very practical way to your family or to the church family. I'm asking you, what is the master saying to you? I love this verse. I think it's in Corinthians, but he says in that, he says, I'm offering my life up or my body up to, to, the, to, ma- to the master. I want to be a useful instrument. I want to be a useful vessel. And maybe there's something God's pinpointed in your life today and he's asking you to surrender it. And I want you to ask for his help. Finally, ask God to cause you to obey more out of the motivation of joy and gratitude rather than just mere duty and drudgery, right? Think about a specific area that God's calling you to obey today. Maybe he's calling you to it and you're like, I don't, I don't, I didn't sign up for that. I don't think that's a good deal. That's too hard, right? Anybody have something like that? You've got some relationship that's difficult that God's asking you to love. He's asking you to speak truth. I know the other day I was standing before a guy when we were going to door to door and inviting people. He wasn't a Christian. He didn't like the idea of talking about the exclusivity of Christ and who God was in the gospel. Whatever that moment is, this is what I'm asking you. Will you pause right now, whatever act of obedience or presenting your heart or your life to God, and will you ask God this? David said that Paul said, that we can have joy in serving you. We can have joy in slavery to God. And I'm asking that you would give me that type of joy in following you and knowing you. And I'm asking you to give me that type of joy in this specific act of obedience, in this specific offering up my life to you. And let's pray that God would do that for his glory. Let's live out of the freedom produced by Jesus' life imparting grace. Let's pray together.